It's a wasteland, part of the country shrouded in intrigue and conspiracy theories. It's a decades-old government secret that fascinates and mystifies YouTubers, B-movie makers, and even the biggest Hollywood studios. But what is the real truth about Area 51? Area 51 is located about 70 miles north-northwest of Las Vegas, near the little town of Rachel, Nevada. It is adjacent to a dry lake bed, Groom Lake. The town of Rachel has made a tourist industry out of the conspiracy theories around aliens, but security is no joke. If you approach the perimeter, you will undoubtedly see these white pickup trucks on the hilltops. They are manned by what are popularly known as camo dudes. They are contractors hired by the Air Force to provide security around the perimeter of Area 51. The warning area is 4808A. It is popularly known among aviators operating out of Nellis as the box. If you do an exercise like Red Flag, you are told in no uncertain terms, if you fly into the box, you will be thrown out of this exercise. So you very much avoid the box when flying around Nellis. So the origins go back to the end of World War II when our focus shifted from defeating Nazi Germany to stopping the spread of Soviet communism. In the late 40s, we were very concerned about the growth of their nuclear weapons programs as well as their space program. And our means of getting intelligence were shifting rapidly. Knowing that they had gaps in their radar coverage, we started doing reconnaissance flights through those gaps. We started using conventional aircraft like the RB-47. We knew that the Soviets could see our airplanes, but there was no response, so we just kept going. As we got into the 1950s, the Soviets became very aggressive in defending their airspace. On the 8th of April in 1950, Soviet fighters shot down a U.S. Navy privateer patrol aircraft over the Baltic Sea. And then later that year, the Soviet Union extended its severe air defense policy, as they called it, to the Far East. Then in the autumn of 1951, Soviet aircraft downed a twin-engine U.S. Navy Neptune near Vladivostok. And then on the 13th of June 1952, an RB-29 was lost in the Sea of Japan, assumed to be a victim of Soviet fighters. So aerial reconnaissance of the Soviet Union had become a very dangerous business. So as a result, the United States began planning for a more systematic, less dangerous approach to aerial reconnaissance. A leading advocate of the need for the new high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft was a guy named Richard Leghorn, an MIT grad who worked for Eastman Kodak, the camera company, and he had commanded the Army's 8th Air Force 67th Reconnaissance Group in Europe during World War II. So after the war, he'd gone back to Kodak, but he maintained his interest in photo reconnaissance. So for his crime of having a good idea, Leghorn was recalled to active duty in the Air Force. He was made a lieutenant colonel and became the head of the reconnaissance systems branch of the Wright Air Development Command in Dayton, Ohio. And this was in April of 1951. So as Leghorn starts to develop this camera system, he also starts to think about the platform that will host it. So there are two primary parameters that they have to defend against. One is the MiG-17 is the Soviet's premier fighter at this time, and it could fly up to an altitude of 45,000 feet. The second concern is their strategic SAMs, which based on the shared technology we gave the Soviets towards the end of the war, we figured they had a system that could go as high as 60,000 feet. So this reconnaissance aircraft that we were designing had to be able to operate above 60,000 feet. So based on those requirements, Lockheed aircraft designer Kelly Johnson came up with what he called the CL-282. So this was a subsonic airplane, lightweight, that could fly upwards of 80,000 feet. Lockheed got the contract, $19 million for 20 airplanes. And that seems like a good price when you think of how much airplanes cost these days. So now they had to figure out where were they going to test these airplanes. So they needed an area that was very secret. How much more black could this be? And the answer is none. Lockheed's headquarters was in Burbank, and General Electric, the engine maker, was in Massachusetts. So neither of those areas was good for testing the airplane. So they started to scout 
the Mojave Desert areas, near where they had tested the atom bomb at the end of World War II. Because of the atom bomb testing, most of these ranges were controlled by the AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission. So on April 12, 1955, a guy named Richard Bissell and Colonel Osmond Ritland, who was the senior Air Force officer on the project staff, flew over Nevada with Kelly Johnson in a small beach craft piloted by Lockheed's chief test pilot, a guy named Tony Levere. They spotted what appeared to be an airstrip in a salt flat known as Groom Lake near the northeast corner of the Atomic Energy Commission's Nevada Proving Ground. Levere chose to set down on the lake bed itself and they walked over to examine the strip. As they looked at it from the air, the strip appeared to be paved, but as they got to it, it turned out to have originally been fashioned from compacted earth that had turned into ankle-deep dust after more than a decade of not being used. So if Levere had attempted to land on the strip, the plane probably would have nosed over when the wheel sank into the loose soil and it would have killed or injured all of the key figures on this project. So the official code word for this project was Aquatone. As they went to the president, they pitched a partnership between the CIA and the Air Force. And President Eisenhower said, no, I want this to be a totally CIA-run operation because of the liability in the event that an airplane is shot down over the Soviet Union. Tensions were heightened in the mid-50s, and there was some definite gamesmanship going on between Eisenhower and Khrushchev. Eisenhower didn't want to give him any easy wins by having a military airplane shot down over the Soviet Union, which would be cause to go to war. So they have to start the logistics and infrastructure part, which means paving the runway, preparing the roads in and out of Area 51, and starting to read people into the program so that they can get it going. They want to rapidly field this airplane. So the U-2 is basically a high altitude glider that takes off at about 100 knots, and when it gets up to 70 or 80,000 feet, it flies around just subsonic. So they had to field a pilot corps. They went to the Air Force and started to read candidates in, enticing them with a bonus, and also the idea that in the event that the program either failed or it was over, they could return to their career path without any penalty. So they were able to field the officers they needed and get this thing going in a hurry. Because this was a black program, they had to have a cover story. So the families of the pilots believed that their husbands were stationed at March Air Force Base and were flying in and around that facility. In actuality, they were taking a transport airplane from March to Las Vegas and then up to land at the airfield at Area 51. They get the program going. They have to deal with a number of things that are unique to this new thing called very high altitude flight. Pilots had to wear pressure suits. So the first version didn't come with any way for the pilots to relieve themselves. And this was a problem because the missions were upwards of six hours long. So they modified that to a suit that the pilots had to catheterize themselves before they fully put the suit on. That was, as you can imagine, pretty uncomfortable and not very popular with the pilots. So they modified the suit once again so it would have an external bladder so pilots could relieve themselves. So that problem was solved. The pilots would have to pre-breathe pure oxygen before the flight so they would be able to adapt to the high altitude environment once they got up there. And so this was all new. The cockpit was very small. Pilots could be no taller than 5'9 and 165 pounds. There were other system considerations. As a result, they had to read in subcontractors into the program because things like the altimeter had to be made special. Previous altimeters only went to 45,000 feet. And so Kelly Johnson goes to this altimeter maker and says, hey, we need an altimeter that can go to 80,000 feet. They're like, why? He's like, come over here. I got to tell you a secret. And now you're in a black program. Same thing with the fuel system. Jimmy Doolittle of Doolittle Raid fame. You remember B-25s launching off Hornets, attacking the Japanese mainland just as a moral victory early in the war. After he left the Air Force, he became a vice president at Shell Oil. Shell Oil won the contract to develop a fuel that could work at high altitude because your standard military jet fuel could not work up there. 
So as a result, they had to shift their manufacturing focus from a bug spray that they normally would manufacture to this special fuel that was used at high altitude. So for that year, the supply chain for that bug spray was severely limited and people noticed, but they didn't pull the string as to why. And if they had, they would have been given some cover story that wouldn't have led them to the U2 program. So the U2 was called U because U stands for utility. The cover story was this was not a reconnaissance aircraft. This was a weather research aircraft. Now the Air Force already had a U1 and a U3, so they made this airplane the U2. So in 18 months from idea to ready for fleet use, this airplane was developed. They had two crashes, one killed the pilot and they used the cover story that he was flying an F-105 and not a U-2. So they deployed the airplane in the spring of 1956 out of Lakenheath in England and also Wiesbaden, Germany. They started flying these missions over the Soviet Union. These missions were successful and effective. They came up with a lot of imagery that showed how the Russians were developing their ICBM program as well as their space program. Now, on the 1st of May, 1960, Francis Gary Powers launched out of a base in Pakistan and was shot down over Russia by an SA-2 about halfway through his mission. Another thing about being a U-2 pilot flying over the Soviet Union, you were issued what was called an L-pill. The L-pill was a cyanide tablet, and you were supposed to commit suicide if you ejected from your U-2 instead of falling into communist Russia's hands. Gary Powers did not do that. So he became a pawn of Khrushchev, and Khrushchev used that to the hilt. So at first, the Americans knew that Powers had been shot down, but they didn't know if he was dead or alive. And Khrushchev did not tell them that he was alive. So Khrushchev wanted to see how long they would continue the lie, imagining that Powers wouldn't be telling them everything that he told him. So Powers was tortured and did give up a considerable amount of information before he was repatriated. There was some question about how Powers conducted himself. But regardless of that, immediately President Eisenhower shut down the U-2 overflights of the Soviet Union. At the same time, the folks that were involved in designing and testing and fielding the U-2 were concerned of just such an outcome. Their concern all along was the U-2 as a subsonic airplane was way too slow for this strategic SAM environment that the Russians had. So they started thinking about a supersonic version of a high altitude reconnaissance airplane. So they got approval from the president and DOD. And they started basically what was a two-way competition between Lockheed and Convair that made the B-58 to develop this high-speed, high-altitude reconnaissance airplane. So the Convair idea was to attach a ramjet aircraft to the bottom of the B-58. The B-58 would climb up to altitude, and then that ramjet aircraft would jettison and then fly away at supersonic speeds using the ramjet, which needed to be sort of pre-charged at high speed before those engines would light off. And then when it was done, it would glide back to wherever it needed to go. Now, the Air Force sort of crushed that idea right out of the gate. It didn't get very far. So Convair wound up coming up with this design. While Kelly Johnson iterated between this first thing into what ultimately became the A-12. The A-12 got the contract and they set about doing the testing again using Area 51 for the A-12. Because the A-12 needed more runway to take off and was a faster airplane and needed a bigger hangar because it was a much bigger airplane, they needed to do some significant modifications to the Area 51 runway, including Kelly Johnson figured out how to redesign the runway so the cracks in the runway didn't jostle the airplane too much, which would cause problems potentially with the cameras on takeoff. He also improved the roads, again, leading in and out of Area 51. So now the civilian crew, again, with a tiny little cover story, worked out of Burbank, would take off out of Burbank, fly to McCarran, 
and then fly into Area 51. Again, the Air Force pilots cover story was they were stationed at March Air Force Base. Just as had been the case with the U-2, the A-12 code name of this project was Oxcart, was rapidly prototyped, developed, and fielded. Now, it was never used for Soviet Union overflights. It was used during the middle part of the Vietnam War to do overflights of North Vietnam. And the other thing to note is just like with the U-2, the A-12 program was a CIA program. This was a CIA Air Force airplane, not a United States Air Force airplane at first. Now, in time, the Air Force needed a high-speed, high-altitude reconnaissance airplane, so they made their own version of the A-12 called the SR-71 Blackbird. Mach 3 airplane, high-altitude, really a badass machine. Now, the reason it's called the SR-71 and not what they wanted to call it, which was the RS-71, is because when President Lyndon Johnson unveiled the airplane, he misspoke and he called it the SR-71 instead of the RS-71. So as a result, they just changed it. So kind of a very Air Force kind of thing to do. The U-2 actually had a much longer life than the A-12 or the SR-71. It was used in a whole bunch of different campaigns, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, to identify the fact that the Russians had placed SA-2s in Cuba, which led to that heightened situation in October of 1962, which was President Kennedy's main test during his administration. But after that, the programs were shut down and Area 51 started being used for other things. Eventually, along with Tonopah, Area 51 was used in the development of the F-117 stealth fighter. Now, none of this was known to the public until the CIA had to honor a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request that came through in 2013. So they released this comprehensive history. It is a 400-page document that you can read online. I highly recommend it. It is really amazing. And it has all kinds of details that would fascinate an aviation historian or a student of the Cold War. This was a very specific time and the pressure on the United States to develop things and sort of break the rules was intense and unique. And that explains a lot of the secrecy around Area 51 and a lot of the ways that they bypassed the normal procurement laws to get these airplanes made in a hurry. And that yielded some bad things ultimately, which is another part of the story as well. But the U-2 and Oxcart programs were basically the reason that Area 51 exists. So fast forward to 1989, a guy named Bob Lazar goes on a Las Vegas TV station using the pseudonym Dennis with his face hidden, and he says he was employed at quote unquote S4. A facility says is near Nellis Air Force Base, the installation known as Area 51. He says where he was was adjacent not to Groom Lake, but Papoose Lake, which is south of Groom Lake, and he said his job was to help reverse engineer one of nine flying saucers that they were in possession of. His flying saucer that he was in charge of was called the Sport Model, and it was manufactured out of a metallic substance, which was similar to stainless steel. So Lazar says that the propulsion on this vehicle is an antimatter reactor. He said the craft had two main levels. Reactor is at the center of the upper level, an antenna on the top surrounded by three quote-unquote gravity amplifiers. Those connected to a gravity emitter on the lower level, which can rotate 180 degrees to output a quote gravity beam or anti-gravity wave, end quote. And that craft would then travel belly first into this distortion field. He also said that the, the seats of this flying saucer were what we would call child-sized and that he had seen alien cadavers of a child size. He said he briefly glanced through a window and saw two men in lab coats talking to something small with long arms. So the existence of Bob Lazar fueled a million conspiracy theories and gave a lot of velocity to the idea there was stuff going on at Area 51 that was otherworldly. 
So whatever people want to believe about UFOs, what we do know to be true is Aquatone and Oxcart did take place at Area 51. And as they did the math of the reported sightings of UFOs during that time and where the test articles were, they realized that what pilots were seeing were test aircraft doing developmental tests. So that's all explainable. That's not extraterrestrial activity. The other thing we know about Area 51 comes courtesy of a lawsuit. So a guy who worked at the facility for nine years named Fred Dunham was suing for $150,000 of workman comp that he's supposed to get as a energy department worker. He was a contractor with EG&G, the same company that Bob Lazar claimed to have worked for. So Dunham had pulmonary disease and other symptoms that were consistent with people who'd been exposed to toxic materials, and in his case, toxic fumes. He explained to a labor department hearing that he had been part of a systematic burning of hazardous materials and liquids at the site during the F-117 developmental program. So these are stealth materials and other chemicals and things used in creating that airplane. Dunham and others in his situation had their case taken up by high visibility lawyer Jonathan Turley, who you may have seen on TV from time to time. And Turley in turn wrote an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times in 2013 that said the following. Area 51 was more than a national security site. It was also an alleged crime scene. And at least two good men may have died from what occurred there. They were not hurt by aliens, but by their own government, which refused to declassify information they needed to understand what had happened to them. When workers at Area 51 first came to me in the 1990s, they described how the government had placed discarded equipment and hazardous waste in open trenches, the length of football fields, then doused them with jet fuel and set them on fire. The highly toxic smoke billowing through the desert base was known as London fog. Many came down with classic skin and respiratory illnesses associated with exposure to burning hazardous waste. The first hurdle was the government's refusal to acknowledge even the existence, let alone the name of the facility. We supplied pictures of the base. We supplied affidavits from workers at the base. We even submitted pictures of planes taking off in Las Vegas and then the same planes landing at Area 51. In the end, we prevailed in demonstrating that the government had acted in violation of federal law. However, the government refused to declassify information about what it had burned in the trenches, which meant the workers still didn't know what they'd been exposed to. The government also refused to acknowledge the name of the base. It's not anything as exciting or glamorous as extraterrestrials. It's the cover-up of the burning of hazardous materials. Remember, as I said with the episode, the secret program that hid a secret program, never sleep on the subterfuge and sleight of hand the government is capable of when it wants to protect secrets. Now, another random tidbit about Area 51 is in 2019, a Facebook group called Storm Area 51 was organized. Now, this looked like it was coming together and like people really thought that, you know, they can't arrest us all. But the Lincoln County deputies, the law enforcement agency around Rachel, Nevada and Area 51, reminded the public that they had used deadly force earlier in 2019 and storming Area 51 was a bad idea. So fortunately, that Facebook group heeded the warning, and I think they had a rock concert near the Alien Jerky establishment instead. So for the official record, if you submit a question to the Department of Defense about Area 51, here's the response you get. This responds to your letter to the Secretary of the Air Force regarding Area 51. Neither the Air Force nor the Department of Defense owns or operates any location known as Area 51, there are a variety of activities, some of which are classified, throughout what is often called the Air Force's Nellis Range Complex. There is an operating location near Groom Dry Lake. Specific activities and operations conducted on the Nellis Range, both past and present, remain classified and cannot be discussed publicly. We hope this information was helpful. So there you go. Your Department of Defense is here to answer your questions and help however they can. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber. Give me the likes and comment.
I try to engage with commenters as much as I can. If you'd like to help support this channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart with the dollar sign icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. Check the links below for official channel merch and where to get the Punks Trilogy, which has just been reissued by the Naval Institute Press, my first three books about life in an F-14 squadron ashore and at sea. And as always, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank <laughs> you.